Good morning. Uh, this is Ron. Good morning. We, we had a beautiful lesson yesterday, very energetic uh, and uh, insightful. We were talking about uh, the history of Africa, the African history, rather, our history uh, before slavery. And we went back as far as we could. We we even looked at the original name of Africa and how talked about how significant that was. So we'll sort of uh, pick up today and see if we have any questions and or comments as everyone has had time to kind of digest that and uh, see where it takes us today. Okay, any questions or comments? Ron, this is Evelyn. Good morning, family. I have a comment. Um, okay. After we got off the broadcast on yesterday, I uh -huh. went to YouTube and went to um, Akibalon 101, and I couldn't intake everything that was on there because it was so enriched. It was so profound on what they talked about. I mean, I can see why they try to erase everything or they, you know, did what they did, the Europeans or whatever, because our heritage, our, our, where we come from is so enriched, who we are. And I just want to, um, to share that. It was just so profound. I, I just, it was just, I don't know. I, I have no words for explaining um, what I saw. And I realized too, if they were to inject more of our history and who we are in the school system, the dropout rate would not be as high as it is. And, and people will learn who they are. I mean, I'm, it was so enriched. I, I, just, I can go on and on, but I'll just stop right there. Thank you for listening. Your excitement talks, your excitement tells the whole story of them in your voice. Um, anyone else? Were you still Question? talking? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you. Were... I, I I agree with you. So much information out there, uh, and it is. Uh, Ron, you. And you get excited to look freezing. at the richness uh -huh. of it and and all the uh the, the detail. Huh? We are not getting everything you're okay. saying. You you're freezing. It's kind of an overcast. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Well, uh, somebody else talking. I'm I'll, I'll change rooms right quick. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or comments in reference to yesterday? But good morning, everyone. Um, one one of the things about a cable line uh, that we've we've talked about in the past, all of your designer symbols like Duckhead, Izard, uh, Levi, Gucci, all of those symbols come from a cable line. Um, and I'm 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 somewhat. When I first was introduced to a cable line, I was excited, just like Miss Evelyn, um, just to learn um, something that's not taught. So uh, all of our symbols by way of designers, um, they come from a cable line. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else before? Um... We guess uh, delve in, uh, dive into where we are. Yeah, I just have you know one point um, that I wanted to share in terms of Evelyn and George said, you know, the symbols actually opens up our third eye, our third ear, and our third nostrils, and is sensitive, you know, to who we are. Uh, something that again, Evelyn said that I sometimes just have a joy for is I'm excited about my life because I know who I am as Christ. And when I say Christ, you know, I'm talking about the anointing. I'm talking about 
you know, who I really am. And so I too, you know, confer what both of them said to be excited at this time to learn what we're learning is truly a, a joy. So I just want to share those thoughts. Thank you. Um, I just want to share that um, when we talked about, um, gosh, it escaped my mind, um, chaos and, des and desire, um, that really resonated with me because I think a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the possibility of Donald Trump coming back, being reelected president, I was saying how nervous that made me feel. But after talking about chaos and desire, I mean, it gives me a whole new perspective on what's happening here. So I feel so much better. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I think that our discussion, especially yesterday, um, awakened something within us. I, I think that it awakened more, honestly, it awakened more in us than probably any discussion we've had. That's the power of knowing where your roots are. That's the power in the unicity of who we are. We have to be freed from the Willis, Willie Lynch syndrome. And I'll talk about that later, what the Willie Lynch syndrome is. And yesterday, the, the way things seemingly resonated with everyone, we were freed from the Willie Lynch syndrome. And it's our obligation to free others. Can you imagine, as Evelyn talked about, the changes that would take place in our youth if they really knew uh, who they are? E even if they don't even know about it, that they are Elohim, if they know where they came from, it would make a difference. It, it would instill tremendous pride in them. Um, James Baldwin said, as I mentioned yesterday, an African-American is an African without memory and an American without privilege. Yesterday, we renewed the memory of the African. So we are Africans with a memory. And we are Africans with privilege. American privilege has everything to do with the material world. African privilege has everything to do with the spiritual world. So I much prefer being the African with privilege, the African with memory. If we embrace what America is, then we have embraced genocide, slavery, um, imperialism, everything that you can think of that is that creates conflict in the world. That's what American policy and politics is about. When you have written in your constitution that the purpose of your uh, secretary of the treasury is to control the value of all currency worldwide, that speaks volumes. Not only does it speak volumes about uh, the imperialistic uh, attitude of that, but it also speaks volumes about where uh, your um, priorities lie. So that's the major reason I'm, I say that. I would rather be an African with privileges than to have the privileges of America that blind me to who I am. And I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, what I hear you saying then is that. Hello? Go ahead, dear. 
What I hear you saying is that when you take what Baldwin said, African without memory and an American without privilege, part of our purpose in, in, in this in this nation as well as the world is to transform um, that privilege, which is materialistic and earth conscious oriented, into a, a spiritual entity, a, a nation that is a spiritual entity, and not only this nation but every nation. So African American is that one who remembers who it is. The African is one who remembers who it is and understands its spiritual essence and privilege, purpose to show the world its own spiritual privilege memory. Thank you. Um, before we delve into um, pick up where we left off yesterday, it is difficult. It has been difficult for Africans to even accept the reality that we are Africans. Um, it's, it's difficult for us to, to speak the truth. And the difficulty is not because we don't want to. The difficulty is because we've been indoctrinated to be cautious about what we say, especially when it is uh, making statements about uh, how we've been treated in the past and how we're currently treated. And when we talk about um, how Europe damaged the whole world, um, we have been taught to be selective in our accusations, even though we're telling the truth. Uh, that has to change. Um, and I think it changed yesterday. What was that you said about Charles Levon? You on mute, baby? Yeah, I'm also on George's computer. Um, I got this statement from Billy Carson the second. He said, "If the truth makes you uncomfortable, don't blame the truth. Blame the lie that made you comfortable." Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. Like that. Yeah. Mm. Say that again. The truth makes you uncomfortable. Don't blame the truth. Blame the lies that made you comfortable. Um, that speaks volumes about our plight and why it has taken so long for us to speak the truth. Um, right now, we have to question ourselves. Why is it difficult to call yourself an African? Is it because the lie that you've been told has made you so comfortable until you are willing to deny your ancestry in order to please the enslaver? That's a question that all of us should be asking ourselves if we were discomforted. <laughs> Yesterday, well, first of all, are there any questions or comments about uh, what LeVon just stated? Well, Reb, I, I have a quick question for the group. Um, being that the African is spiritual, um, what is the view of others as it relates to reparations? 
Um, my father, his view on reparations was it should be uh, allocated back toward historic psychologists. So if we are spiritual, do we really need reparations? Um, and, and just want to hear the, the thoughts of the thoughts of others. I think we need reparation. I just don't think I need to be given an end of, uh, as an individual. I need to be given so much money. I think it needs to start in education with Head Start and works it, work its way up to technical schools, colleges, universities. So uh, <sighs> as it relates to the African being spiritual, Reverend Richard and others, do you think we need re reparations or you don't think we need reparations? Thank you. Let me say just as a disclaimer. I was very active in seeking reparation with the Black Man's Liberation Army that was organized in DC. And one of my instructors uh, was one of the people who spearheaded that movement uh, during the um, 60s and continues to work with it now. So having said that, I have been uh, exploring this for quite a few years. I really don't want to do a deep dive until we get to America, the African in America. However, I will say uh, that um, America cannot afford to pay reparations. And um, I'll get deeper into that later on if you if that's okay with you, George. Yeah, I ain't hard to get along with. That's cool with me. Okay, just remind me of it when we get to uh, Africans in America, okay? When we start talking about that. Um, yesterday, uh, we talked in depth about um, the Kushites. We spoke in, in depth uh, about um, the uh, foundational principles uh, that Africans live by. Uh, the principles of um, the 42 laws of Maya. We talked about that. And we talked about how uh, there was a requirement in Egypt, which is known as Egypt, now Haiku Pata, there was a requirement that everyone read them twice a day. Now, in order for them to have a requirement, for everyone to read them twice a day, that means that everyone could read. Um, that also means something else. The Kushites, uh, and what you will find when you study in this history, you will find uh, Kushite and Twa, Twa and Buti, interchanges. It's the same people. It is, imp it is to me anyway, to, to note that, it's important to note that the crux of spirituality centered in what is known as Egypt now. And from the, um, the history that we have spoken of and been uh, privy um, to access. Um, what we have seen is, is that it's like a flow. Everything moved from um, Southeastern Africa all the way up and centered in, in the um, north, in the north of, of um, the continent. And, and that's, that in itself um, speaks volumes. Why is it that that had to become the center of uh, spirituality? Why? Why is it that the primary foundation for spirituality was laid there? Why is it that if you were to look at the, the uh, the routes that uh, the, the um, pathways of travel 
that the Chua slash Kushites uh, traveled. If you look at those pathways, if you look, uh, you, you will find that whether it is Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, all of it came from the same people. Now, of course, they have morphed into something totally different than what they were in the beginning. And this coincides with the 25th chapter of Genesis, when it talks about uh, Abraham uh, giving his, uh, this, his um, sons, five sons, gifts, and they went into the East. Uh, this is uh, speaking of the, and we talked about this in there, the spiritual understandings that were carried into different places. Um, the East represents more than just uh, geographical direction. Buddhism um, was um, primary in India uh, and other Asian areas. And with the influx of Europeans, Brahmin came into play. And when Brahmin came into play, the the deities uh, that were recognized um, before it came into play, the deities recognized the, the feminine energy and reverenced it to the extent that um, males were uh, what? I, I don't want to use the word submissive because that's not the right term. Uh, males embraced wholeheartedly uh, the the leadership and the and the power powerful presence of femininity in their lives. When Brahman came into play, it shifted from a, a um, feminine uh, presence in in power to a masculine presence, but it did not just the masculine presence. But that masculine presence also suppressed femininity in that same area. So that in itself, uh, you can begin to see the changes. If you study uh, the religions of the world and you trace their roots, and you what you will find that their roots go back to um, uh, Hakupata, that area that's known as Egypt. And you will see also uh, that all of the deities in the beginning uh, were feminine. And the reason they were feminine is because life comes from the womb. And, and life uh, has always been precious and always been seen uh, as a gift from our creator. And what you will see, if, we, if you look at the religions of the world, you will see how they uh, morphed into male-dominated entities um, with um, uh, um, a great degree of, of um, oppression to, towards um, females. And you will also see that this... Um, male-dominated society or energy or religion emanated from uh, the descendants of Europe as opposed to um, being in play from the beginning. Um, yesterday, we, we didn't delve that much into the, into the religions and how they originated or had found their seed. And... Um, in Egypt, we talked about how the um, migration from the uh, east coast of Africa and northeast, especially of Africa, into the interior of Africa transpired. How it, why it transpired, and why, and that there are still remnants of the original immigrants to that part of Africa in terms of the methods of worship. <clears throat> so, if we if we are seriously seeking to understand 
the spiritual essence of our being, then we have to embrace the reality that the seed of spirituality came um, from Africa, period. And, and um, when, when the migration took place over a, thousands of years, what happened is the influx of, of Europeans. And with the influx of Europeans, everything started to change. And the major players in the change that was taking place in the interior of Africa uh, was led by and approved by the Pope. Catholicism was a major player in what took place uh, in, in the um, interior of Africa. And the um, major players were not there to bring, to create Christians or to um, give the word of God. Uh, they were there to manipulate the minds of the people in order to enslave them. And, and that was the methodology. So if we are looking at true spirituality, then we must be honest about uh, Christianity. Uh, Catholicism is Christianity. It's the, um, actually the, the seed of Christianity, not the womb. We must be honest about it, that Christianity has never uh, been a religion that cared anything about humanity. It's always been a manipulative religion. And the manipulation of that religion was designed to manipulate the minds of people of color, Africans in particular. Now, for those of you who may be feeling uncomfortable about what's being said, ask yourself this question. If all spirituality um, had its, has its origin in Eastern, Northeastern Africa, as, uh, as well as Eastern Africa, why is it that this new thing called Christianity why is it that it is it carries more truth than the original? Why is it that we see the this, this cyclical nature of Christianity and the progressive nature of spirituality when we look at it through the eye of the Kushite? Why is it cyclical? Why is it in a religion? that does not foster change in terms of the improvement of the lives of humanity. If it's, if it's real, why is it that it remains a tool of enslavement? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Someone who is about to say something? Why is it a, a still a tool of enslavement? When we start talking about the Willie Lynch syndrome, what you will see is the whole objective of making a Negro Christian. And there, there are several books out that, that um, actually documents that. What you will see is the objective was to enslave the mind and, and maintain ownership of the body. The objective was to keep shackles on the mind. And regardless of whether the chains were there, you would be an eternal slave. With that understanding, don't you think it's time for us to look at the origin of everything that is? Do you uh, believe 
that the understanding of spirituality, or for that matter, um, the the uh, origin of a people. In order to understand it, you will have to go back to the beginning. Don't, do you believe that? And if we believe that, we have to go back to the beginning. Then we understand something. Just like our history did not start at the roof, at the ocean's edge in America. Our history did not start when we were put on a slave ship. Our history did not start when we were docked in Charleston or wherever we are uh, deported to ship. Our history started thousands of years before that. Then we must also embrace that our spiritual beliefs did not start with Christianity in, in Africa as it was used by the uh, Christian church to enslave us and to rob us of our resources. We must pierce the bubble of um, the Western religions that have kept us separated for all of these years and kept us enslaved in our minds for all of these years. Um, May I ask a question? Sure. Um, that includes Islam too. Yes. Doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, I mean, because many, I think many African Americans may feel like um, we were, we came from Islam. We brought Islam over with us from Africa in a lot of cases. So they may feel like that's part of their beginning. They do, uh, especially um, Elijah Muhammad and the um, black Muslims. They, they, they do believe that. Um, I, I cannot use the words that John Henry Clark used when he uh, addressed that very thing that you mentioned. Uh, it's an inappropriate language when he was teaching. He, uh, he, he said that we have no connections to Islam that, that are historically relevant. They enslaved us. They were the slave catchers uh, for uh, Europeans. They sold us. And he said that, yes, there were some who looked like us, who sold us. But the majority of the Muslims who, who sold us look like what they look like today, Arabs. So we, have, we owe nothing to Islam. Islam is no different than Christianity. Um, it's funny because Islam is no different than Christianity. And um, uh, Islam uses the Old Testament and Islam has, is not a label. It is a, it speaks of uh, submission to God. And Christianity speaks to um, submission to the teachings of Jesus, the Christ. And Judaism speaks to nothing. Uh, well, Rev, a uh, quick question for you, and, and give me for interrupting. Why does Islam, or the, the nation of Islam, or five percenters, why does that have such an attraction toward African Americans, more so than Christianity? Um, when I look at Christianity, and I look at that as the affluent uh, African American, and when I look at uh, five percenters, uh, nation of Islam, that is the, the, the poor uh, or the undesirable takes a liking. I shouldn't say poor in that case. The undesirable takes a liking toward the nation of Islam. Or you have a, a, an answer well, to that? Yes, I do. First of all, um, the, the, 
quote unquote undesirables who um, looked at Islam with a positive attitude was simply because um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad reached out to those who were destitute. He reached out to those who were imprisoned and he gave them an opportunity to lift themselves from um, the criminal activity that they were engaged in. He gave them pride in themselves and in and our people, and they embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, during that period of the nation of Islam's strength and power um, in America, they had the strongest educational departments in any schools in, in the world, primarily, because kids were learning uh, algebra and they had, they were, uh, they learned multiple languages before they were 10 years old. That those were the schools of the nation of Islam. Plus the nation of Islam um, fostered clean eating, meaning that uh, they were taught to eat only organic food that they grew themselves. They had major farms in our, and their food was um, brought in from their farms and distributed around the country where there were um, Nation of Islam mosques. The most famous restaurant of the Nation of Islam was in Chicago, in the Loop. Um, it, it, if it were in, in operation today, it would be a diamond restaurant. Uh, that would be the rating on it. They would be rated in the Michelin, whatever the thing is. Um, that's the nature of that restaurant. So people were attracted uh, to that, but more importantly, uh, the Nation of Islam did something that Christianity did not do. Christianity shunned people who were uh, engaged uh, in criminal activity or people who uh, were released from prison. Uh, they did not reach into the prisons. Christianity didn't reach into the prisons uh, to help people. It reached into prisons only to recruit, not change lives. Uh, so that's the difference between uh, the two. And I'm, I'm very well versed uh, in the um, policy and polity of the Nation of Islam because um, we were deeply integrated in them and um, what they believed, and we only ate at their restaurants if they were if they existed in any city that we traveled to. Um, we um, appreciated, respected, and embraced them because when a Muslim moved into a uh, apartment complex, when he and his family went in, there was no drugs in that complex anymore because. Um, they confronted the drug dealers and they gave them ultimatums and they did not deal drugs in uh, those uh, complexes. So th that's one of the major reasons that um, we looked upon them favorably, yet we did not become a Muslim. And now the added back in the day used to be, man, if you go to prison, uh, join the Nation of Islam, you'll be protected. And the protection was from the Aryan Brotherhood that was in prison. So I hope that answers you, George. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Any questions or comments about that? But, um, but that ahead. was but that was because they they wanted to see past Christianity but they mm -hmm. didn't see beginning. Yes. Yes. That's my question. But that's it. That's the answer. Yes. Um, they did. Because they saw they saw the uh they saw what they thought were the virtues in Islam and they saw the, the terroristic attitude of Christianity. Uh, um the the think about this. Christianity um created and supported terrorism when it came to people of color. And, and yes, they, they looked past it because they were looking for something better. And they did not go 
to the beginning. And that's one of the things that Jenny Clark uh, stressed uh, about Islam, as well as Russ Adams stressed about Islam. Um, C.L.R. James uh, stressed about Islam. These are noted historians. Um, uh, C.L.R. James was one of the uh, best known historians in the world. Uh, he was from Trinidad and he didn't even have a college degree. Um, it was questionable whether or not he would graduate high school, but he he taught himself and he was very well versed in histories. So anyway, um, that's the story of uh, Islam and Christianity. So we must pierce that bubble that has um, or, or tear down the wall that has separated us from our original spirituality. And that wall that must be torn down is definitely Christianity is already added to that Islam as well. Uh, and Judaism. The, we, we don't have labels for who we are in terms of uh, what, what is this religion called? It's not a religion. It's a way of life. The 42 laws of man are a way of life. It, there was the, the discontentment that we experience in this society. We, do, we don't have the capacity to, to um, emotionally or mentally embrace the reality of a society that did not need policemen. A society where uh, conflict didn't exist. A society where poverty was unknown. They didn't know what poverty was. We 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 can't we can't mentally or emotionally embrace that because we've never seen that. We never experienced that. Quite frankly, I doubt if most of us have even heard of a society of that nature. Yet it existed, and it still exists with us. That's what balance also looks like. When harmony prevails, peace also prevails. And it's just not peace between nations, it's peace between each other. Does that make sense, guys? So with having said that, um, I, can, I, I cannot articulate how, I, how I'm seeing this in my soul. It's best I can describe what I'm trying to uh, put forth is, yesterday, for all intents and purposes, we traveled from the East Coast of Africa to Central Africa. And, and then when we got to Central Africa, the closer we got to the West Coast, the more we engage Christianity, the more we engage enslavers. And, and, and um, even before this engagement with, with slavery, uh, with enslavers, uh, in that Central African district, moving uh, westward, we began to see the, um, uh, the, the growth of kingdoms. Uh, and the, the um, best known universities in the world, one, the oldest university system in the world is said to be in Timbuktu. However, I beg to differ because I, I see that also with the Kushite prior to that. And that Timbuktu University was established based upon the concepts of the Kushites that were that migrated from East Africa into uh, the interior of Africa. We see the uh, Kingdom of Mali. We see the, the Ghanaian Kingdom. We see all of these arising. And as we look at um, the, the Ghanaian Kingdom, and if we look at the, Ma the Kingdom of Mali uh, with Masa, Masa Musa, um, we begin to see um, the, the migration establishing the same spiritual systems and the same uh, aspects of the kingdom in all of Africa. And the death of these kingdoms did not come 
because of uh, mismanagement as much as it came because of interference, um, outside interference. Uh, so um, if, uh, and I'm sure that most of us have heard about uh, Massa Musa or the, and the um, Kingdom of Mali, as well as um, the Ghanaian Kingdom. Uh, if there are questions about that uh, or desire to delve a little bit deeper into uh, these kingdoms, I think that's where we are now, unless there are questions um, that are based upon what we've talked about before we got to this point where we are ready to um, delve into an understanding of how life of the African was from Central Africa to the uh, West Coast of Africa. Questions? Pastor, um, can I can I get can I again let them everyone know where they can go after we get off broadcast or at their leisure um the site on YouTube because I want to make sure and just like everybody else that we get this. This is so important. This is who we are. So can I again mention that uh, site that link on YouTube where they can go? Okay. After it's it's the history of Akibalon one zero one. Okay. The history of Akibalon one one zero one. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Any, any questions uh, uh, <clears throat> about our previous discussion, current discussions, or questions about anything that has come to you in regards to um, the journey that we're on? This and is really before we move forward. Just, just to, uh, and I apologize, just to spell a kibalon and to make sure we're pronouncing it correctly, if you don't mind. Okay, hard to hit it. Um, it's A L. K E B U L A N. Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't writing fast enough. I'm sorry. Could Did you, you get that? that sorry. A L K E B U L A N. Okay. Got okay, it. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Okay, Jack. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you. This is Vermel. I have a question. Yes. We've talked about the African going from East Africa westward. Mm. Will, will there be a point where we come back and talk about him having traveled or us having traveled eastward? Um, what was what the question in regards to that? Well, if we or at beginning, would we not have also spread it westward in terms of our spirituality too? Definitely we would have, matter of fact. The African had traveled the world. Okay. Uh, so if you if you and, and it's so much history here, it's difficult, if not impossible, for us to, you know, to touch all of it. Okay. So However, if you look at South America, mm -hmm. and if, if you look at any coastline of any uh, country continent, what you will see are remnants of the African who traveled there. You will see it in the people, or you will see it in the um, artifacts that have been carved in honor of what was called the gods of the sea. Uh, the African was was um, venerated as being gods, especially in South America. And you, you you see on the coastline um, stones that were carved in the image of Africans, and they were not only honoring but welcoming the African to these areas. You you, um, you cannot go to any continent on the face of this earth and not see the remnants of an of a African presence at, at some point in the history of that continent. 
Okay. And by the way, Europe is not a continent. Europe is a peninsula. Um, that's one of the things. Including North America. America. Yeah. I, I was just saying, including North America prior to slavery. Right. Okay. Yeah. And matter of fact, Africans, I mean, I'm, thank you, Ron, were the first uh, people uh, to um, visit North America. Um, North America um, was visited by Africans, and Columbus never visited North America. He never made it, could find his way, uh, even though it is said that. Um, Columbus discovered America. Uh, Columbus didn't discover anything, by the way. But anyway, um, any any other questions or comments about that? I have one more question in, in that sure. regard. Um, and I'm not sure how to phrase it, but as they traveled eastward, the Gaza Strip area, how does that tie in religious spirituality versus religion in the fight that's there now. Oh, there was no Gaza Strip. Right. What we call Gaza Strip. Prior to that, was that not all African held? Oh, uh, yeah. The whole of the continent was African. Especially those areas that you mentioned. Those were, That's the center. That whole area is the center. Of, um, of our spiritual beliefs. See, what you do see on that map, that that uh, when you look at the Rafa Gate in, in um, Egypt, and then you see a boundary there, and then you see a connection to, to the uh, Gaza Strip, and then above that, you see what's uh, labeled Israel. And then you see around it, you see Lebanon, Syria, um, you see Jordan, and 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 uh, in that same area, you see Iran and Iraq. Uh, all of that was Kushite Kingdom, as, as well as Senegal, Ethiopia, etc. All of that was uh, was uh, uh, it, a part of the Kushite Kingdom. Joy, would you mute, please? So then, the Christian, not, not George Wallace. Uh, George, so would you would you wait, hold on a second, ma'am? I'm sorry. Uh, Joe, would you mute, please? Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Hey. So did the... Okay. The map I glanced over did show the African kingdoms there. My question when I was looking, trying to understand what happened religiously, so Christianity and Islam, they came in and put their stamp on top of, for lack of a better word, on top of or try to erase the spirituality in that in that area? No, uh, I don't. I don't think they had um, uh, the the um, Muslims. I, I don't believe that they had sinister sinister or what? Um, they they somebody help me. The objective was not sinister. Uh, the objective was to uh, bring people to the place where they submit to God. Okay. okay. Uh, and that was much later than the uh, spirituality of the Kushite kingdom. That was much okay. later. Uh, yeah, that invasion from, from the north um, was spearheaded by uh, some um, Kushites intermingled with um, what became Arabs. And we talked about that yesterday. Uh, Europeans uh, plus uh, um, North Asians plus Africans uh, intermarrying. That's where Arabs came from. So in Persia, all that came out the same group. Even Palestine, the Palestinians that you see today in the Gaza Strip, um, they are, their heritage that is from uh, Eurasians and Africans. And I say Eurasians because it's European and Asians and Africans. That's where their heritage is. I mean, that's where they all, all come from. And that's why you see you see different features in uh, Arabs and in those in the Palestinians. Uh, and, 
And oh, that's yeah. where the term semi, semi. semi came from? Uh, yes, semi came from that term. I mean, the term semi came from that, yes. Okay. It's right. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the languages began to change, too. And the reason the language started uh, changing, uh, Arabic is a combination of um, several different languages that are African in origin, but also uh, they have um, as well Asian words uh, that are intermingled in their language as well. So it's it's not it is not as simple as we think it is uh, to uh, to delve into and explain. Um, the dynamics of that area during that period of time prior to uh, the um, invasion of um, Muslims. Um, I must say this also about um, the uh, um, about Muhammad. Um, the the Islam, Islam was protective of all religions. Um, the when uh, is that when uh, the Muslim control Assyria, uh, Assyria was a safe haven uh, for um, what was deemed to be Christians and any other religion that was being persecuted. So, anyway, are there any other questions about that? From Mel or anyone else, all comments. I'm good. Okay, thank you. So uh, here we are at the uh, gates of um, the kingdoms in West Africa. Um, I'm and Madam Madam Musa. I I don't want to delve deeply into uh, all of the kingdom, the major kingdoms rather, in that area. But I do want to, to get a gist of what we of what they were. Um, the the um, most of what we know about Mel Musa is that he was the richest man you ever lived. But do we know that he impacted uh, the economy of every nation that he traveled through because of the amount of gold that he left for the benefit of the people and the enhancement of the uh, city or the area? Uh, that he traveled through. Um, he he financed education. He's he was big on on um, education. Uh, he financed libraries and he built universities. He um, sustained the lives of his kingdom of everyone in his kingdom, as well as those who were around it. He was um, the. The, the essence of what it meant to be a, my, uh, your brother's keeper in terms of uh, when he when he was a Muslim, by the way. And when he traveled to Mecca every year, um, Mecca was in Saudi Arabia, which is also in the area that I just named a few moments ago. Um, Mecca, uh, as he traveled to Mecca, that's when he affected the economy every single year because of the amount of gold that he left along the way to benefit people. Um, unlike what we are experiencing now with uh, people who are super wealthy. Uh, so that that in itself is a major difference. And one of the reasons I, I, I like highlighting the um, um, what Nelson Musa did is because it, it uh, gives us an idea of the purpose of money. The purpose of currency. The purpose of currency is not to make you uh, rude, influential, or to manipulate, give you the power to manipulate people. Uh, the it, it, ex extraordinary amount of currency that you possess uh, is to be distributed to those who are in need. Therefore, you eliminate all the par all poverty. And the worst thing that you can say in this country is the redistribution of wealth. That is a no-no to even think about. That. So um, having said that, are there any, is there any other input or questions about um, 
the kingdom of Mali or the kingdom of Ghana? Please feel free to speak. I think. Um, well, Rev. I... Hold, hold one second, George. Go ahead, Audrey. Um, wasn't it Mansa Musa that that financed the African ships that came to North America? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, and when we get into um, Ghana, well, that's modern day Ghana. But Sorry, yeah, you went. No, you I was. I'm thinking. Cut out and, for a moment. <laughs> okay. What was happening is that I'm processing and thinking out loud. That, that's part of the problem. Um. We we'll get we will get also um, we we'll delve deeper in when we get to the Ghanaian Kingdom and bring it up to today. We we'll delve deeper into that. Um, and, but yes, he did uh, finance uh, the voyages of Africans to um, North America and other places around the world. Any other questions or input? Yeah, Reb, uh, uh, to the group, by way of travel, um, what made the Panama Canal such a territory that people went to war over? Was um, it purely just about import-export? No. Or what's the, go ahead, the... My bad, go ahead. The simple explanation to that is this. It was a shorter passage. You did not have to go around the Horn of South America in order uh, to get from one ocean to the other, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So the Panama Canal was um, built in order to make it easier to get from ocean to ocean, from east to west. Uh, is that accurate to you guys? Accurate? I think it is. That's what made it so and that, and, that, and that translates into money. Right. Absolutely. It costs less money to go through the Panama Canal to get from one ocean to the other than to go all the way around. And so he who controlled the Panama Canal had control of money. Right. Ron? Oh, I'm sorry, George, does that answer your question? Hey, appreciate you. Yes, sir. Appreciate was, you, sir. Go ahead, Ron. I was just trying to think of all uh someone to compare him to, I'm saying it's like Metamusa. Uh, there were lands that he's credited with conquering when he didn't really fight wars to conquer them. What he would do is go in and show the people how to be free and how to set up businesses and how to take care of themselves if people would freely become a part of his kingdom. So when he traveled the world, he did so with open hand and open heart and and set up, uh, like you said, libraries and eco, show people how to set up their economy and, and, and those sort of things. And that's how uh, he became as popular as he did and, and setting up his kingdom uh, and expanding the the coast of Ghana. This, this is not modern day Ghana way it is now, but uh, but there were other kingdoms that came after him when his kingdom started to disintegrate because of of greed or others coming in and taking advantage of of those smaller unprotected places. Uh, there were other kings that came in uh, that just took things and, and uh, in, in, you know, starve people or, or not let them be a trade route. So it did not take long before people to see that his idea of everybody having something, not necessarily being wealthy, but everybody sharing in what the land had to offer, uh, people saw a way to, to uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for, take advantage of that and, and enslave people. So the kingdoms that grew out of that grew from, from putting people 
in tight places and in bondage and and I, I just I just think he was his movement was rather unique his approach to to how he took care of things and and uh and to show that if we desire to there's a, enough of everything to go around enough resources to go around and uh that's that's kind of full circle where we are now what we're seeing what we're trying to accomplish keep in mind we're talking about immigrants yeah. from we talk about kushites we're talking about the twa people we're still talking about them um the Ghanaian uh empire can be compared to that because they function basically the same way um and that that is the whole purpose for them existing was to care for the uh, people that they governed and, and to get input from the people as to uh, the direction that the kingdom should take. So so um, would you agree, those of you who have studied the uh, Ghanaian uh, kingdom, that uh, they pretty much were, were uh, alike? Would you, uh, can you see that, brother? Yes, yes. Um, when we, when we would look at these kingdoms, we, we look at how they disintegrated and they disintegrated because of the influx of outsiders. Um, what happened, and, and uh, there's a huge chunk of every, thing that we talked about that we are not mentioning. Some of it is not coming to mind and some of it is just too much to unpack. If we, we could delve into the East Coast of Africa for the next year and still won't unpack it all. Um, the, let me see, are we okay with where we are with the, uh, the kingdoms of, of, of uh, West Africa? and the travel through um, Central Africa and his relationship to Islam, Christianity, et cetera. Are we good with that? Any questions or comments? I, I would take that as a yes. Um, we, when we look at the, the demise of them, what it, care, what it brings us to is the point of enslavement. That's where it brings us. Um, our, our history did not start in slavery. Our nation came into existence because of slavery. And when I say our nation, I'm talking about the nation of, of um, that was born on the water, not in slavery but on the waters. Can you see the difference between Pastor, the nation? Yes. Sorry. What do you mean when you say it was born on the water? On, on, what I mean is that when the slavers uh, placed us into ships and brought us into this to this place of, of um of enslavement, the nation that was born on the water is that between Africa and where we are in, in, in the um, American coastline, in the belly of that ship was birthed a nation, and that nation is us. We are the remnants of that nation. And the nation that was birthed in that ship is a nation that was destined to do exactly what we are doing now bring order to the world. That's what I mean. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about that? Um, the, um, what's it? In the early 1500s, uh, as far as I think it's that, it may have been, it was earlier than that, the Portuguese begun to uh, 
trade to capture and trade Africans and sell Africans uh, into bondage. And they, the, the Portuguese um, got the blessings from uh, the priests in Portugal uh, to do this. And when the rest of Europe saw how lucrative it was, the British in particular, uh, they, they began to engage in, in like manner, capturing Africans <clears throat> and trading, uh, selling Africans uh, into enslavement. And we know that this subsequently led to the destruction of um, a system uh, of community in West Africa, in particular. We, we, we know that that was the onset of the destruction of um, a family society. And we also are aware that during this period, the, the Portuguese built um, what they called a castle, but it was simply a warehouse on the coastline uh, of Ghana. And um, I'm, it was a Benin that has um, one there as well, um, where the uh, enslavers kept the slaves until uh, they uh, filled the ship to the point where they could leave. Audrey? In Senegal. In Senegal. They, they have these, these uh, warehouses where they kept us. Now, let me explain to you what I'm saying. Um, first of all, let, let me back up a bit. When the um, enslavers went in, they went in, you die or you become a slave. They went in with guns. But there's something that they did that no one wants to talk about. In order to denigrate the society, and make them feel helpless. They raped women and female children in, in front of males who could not do anything to protect them. And they used that as a method of dehumanization. And, and, it, and it, it worked because what else could they do other than be killed? And that continued even when it, when the, when we were brought into this country. Now let's get back to the warehouses. Um, these warehouses uh, were equipped with rings in the walls where they would chain the ones who were captured until they uh, were loaded on boats and carried out to the ship. Now think about this. The trip from West Africa to Charleston was like, what? Three months, maybe. Um, the estimate is about three months. Think about this. If it took three weeks to round up enough enslaved people, enough Africans to fill that ship, then that means the first people who were put in that dungeon had been there for three weeks plus the three, two or three months that it took to get to America. It, it had to, there had to be a sense of psychological strength. There had to be in order to be able to do that. There had to be a sense of, of, of emotional control in order to do that, to, to uh, endure what, what um, was happening. The, The and then the way that they were placed in the ship uh, also spoke to the endurance. There is a museum in Baltimore that that shows um, exactly how some of the slave ships were built. And you know how you got a cubby holes in a in a uh, cabinet in your in your room, and you get, you file things in your cubby holes. That, that was how um, the, the, the hull of the ship was built 
with cubby holes just large enough uh, for a human to enter. And they stayed in that position from the time they were placed in there until they were unloaded in Charleston or wherever they were going. In the case of Britain, of course, um, it was different than Charleston. And they stayed in that cubby hole. And everything in that cubby hole, excrement, um, vomit, everything was in that cubby hole. And to survive that, you had to be, you had to know who you are. You had to know that you were greater than what you were seen to be. And even if not that, you had to know that the creator is the one who kept you. I don't know any other people who could have survived such a voyage. Now keep in mind that one of the untold stories about um, the slave trade is this. The Jews in America owned the ships. The Jews in America outfitted the ships with shackles and chains. They financed the trips. They insured the trips. They were auctioneers and slave brokers. They were the primary forces in the economic, um, in the uh, economic export exploitation of Africans. That was the economic arm. So when we talk about slave money in the South, uh, how how slave money made Southerners wealthy, that's also how slave money made the Jewish community wealthy. That's how that's how the Catholic Church became wealthy. All of them on the backs of Africans. So when we when we look at at that, what what do we see? We see a determination to survive. We see not only a determination to, to survive, but we see in the way in, in the balance of the survival. It's a survival of humanity. If we are the first in the earth from the womb of an African, then we are the life of the earth also. And, and uh, I alluded to yesterday, and Nick verified when he said that if we were gone two weeks later, everything would disintegrate if we were no longer here. And 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 the, the thing about it is that they know this, and that is the reason they would not. Well, we we'll get to Marcus Garvin in a few moments. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so doing doing this um, doing this slave trade. <clears throat> Whole communities were made wealthy. And to this day, those family structures <clears throat> from then are wealthy to this day because of the enslavement of the African. Um, you ask, um, why is it? that the African was not allowed to read. Well, the African could read when we came to this country. The African who, Africans who brought to this country were well-educated engineers. Uh, they were iron workers, you name it, they could do it. And <clears throat> they, the uh, Yorubas uh, was mixed um, with the Ghanaians because of linguistic differences. They would they would group them together um, with different languages in order for them not to be able to communicate. And they were killed if they practiced uh, the, um, the worship or the submission to the universe that they practiced prior to coming here. They were only permitted to, to practice Christianity. So you must ask yourself, why is it that they were only permitted to practice Christianity? Christianity was the shackles of the mind. 
the and and Christianity was the governing force for enslavement. If Christianity had been against slavery, it could not exist for a week. If it, without the support of the church. We talk often about the Southern Baptists. The reason they're called Southern Baptists is because the Baptists are, the Baptist convention was held in Tennessee. <clears throat> and those who were members of this Baptist convention who were in other states that did not um, have slaves, uh, the others were abolitionists. So in Tennessee, uh, there was a vote taken to support slavery. And the Southerners actually did not win that vote. So they chose to separate from the ones who were against slavery. The Baptists who were against slavery, now we're talking about all white people, we're not talking about black folk, okay? Some of us in our mind that black folk don't know Baptists, no, we're talking about white folks. So what happened is the American Baptist Convention uh, came out of that meeting in Tennessee. And the Southern Baptist Convention came out of that meeting as well. And the Southern Baptist uh, was um, vehement about maintaining enslavement in the um, slave states where they existed. And um, South Carolina was a leading force in every endeavor uh, that um, involved the enslavement of Africans. Um, so, uh, and we'll get also into South Carolina in the Constitution later on. Um, South, Carolina, South Carolina has always been um, the leading force for everything that was adverse to African people. They were on the cutting edge of, of how to be barbaric and keeping your enslaved people in order, South Carolina. I wonder if it was because um, South Carolina and Georgia primarily were, were populated from Europe by emptying the prisons in Europe. They dumped all the prisoners out of Europe via undesirables on the coast of South Carolina and the coast of um, Georgia and portions of North Carolina. Those were the ones who actually they were the first inhabitants from Europe uh, in these particular states. And they were to establish colonies um, that would be under the authority of the King of England. So I wonder if that's one of the reasons because of the, um, uh, the, the perverted mind of those people uh, being um, the progenitors of the inhabitants of the state and others. Audrey? Well, um, one of the things about South Carolina is that it was the, um, it was like the winter homes of people from like Boston and New York. So you also had that influence there. Um, some of those people own some of the plantations. Um, so even though they were they were living part of their year in non, well, primarily non-slave holding states, but they spent a good portion of their time in South Carolina. So they also influenced what South Carolina was doing. Right. And, and, and um, if you uh, delve into the history of the plantations, you also find that during the summer months, uh, the plantation owners would go north because of the, the uh, mosquitoes. The, 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 it was, the heat was horrendous and, keep, and they didn't have air conditions, okay? 
Yeah, they, that was them, yeah. the people from Boston and whatever. Right. And, they, and so they would go north during the summer and come back to South Carolina uh, during the winter months. That's where this whole um, migration came from. Uh, this whole second homes, uh, uh, that's where it emanated, having a home in both places. And to this day, the same thing occurs. Northerners come to uh, to the South. The difference is that they, they come to the South when it's winter there, but that's where it, that's where it came from. Um, thank you. Uh, any, any questions or anyone else want to uh, uh, add to that or any comment whatsoever? Sage, I have a question. You talked about the Jews financing the ships and slaves coming to America. So their religious beliefs at that time was based in Christianity? No, ma'am. Their, okay. be their beliefs at that time was based in greed. Oh, just, okay. Um, see, this is, the, this is the myth. The myth is that Southerners hated the Jews. That's not true. Okay. If, if you delve into the history of, of, of uh, enslavement, what you will find is that there were Jews who augmented their beliefs in order to be in good standing uh, with the quote-unquote Baptists or the Christians in the South. Also, they intermarried. They they had they socialized together. And that's a myth. There were people indeed who hated Jews, but they were more individuals than there was um, governmental enforcers or plantation owners. Uh, uh, um, keep in mind, if you finance in something, then the people who you're giving the money to are beholden to you. Yes, you gain political power. Yes, and that's exactly what happened, especially in South Carolina. Uh, so, uh, we, you know, examples of that. This whole idea. Let me let me start here. This whole idea of being anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. That whole idea uh, came about in order to um, heap guilt upon anybody who criticizes a Jew. Right now, if I were to talk about this uh, in, in open areas, um, there would be a huge pushback. I would automatically be an anti-Semite simply because I'm telling the truth about the finances of slavery, about the purchase of, uh, of the ships, about the outfitting of slave ships. Uh, that accusation has paralyzed people around the world until now. Until now. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Jewish people in, in the South, if you look at the, the registries or the history that's there, right there in Charleston for that, in, in the uh, Confederate Museum, you would see the role that they played in slavery. Also, um, just a footnote, the term anti-Semite has been used against every African leader in America and abroad. Martin Luther King was called an anti-Semite. Malcolm X. Um, Nelson Mandela, all were called anti-Semitic. And the reason they were called anti-Semitic is because they were telling the truth. King was called anti-Semitic because of boycotting stores, department stores. Um, if you think about Neiman Marcus, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, et cetera, the major department store seals, all of those. They were specifically, uh, in, the employers only hired white people. They did not hire African-Americans. Only thing we could do in a store like that is, is clean the bathroom. So when King began to um, raise 
concern about this and, and uh, talked about the integration, integration and boycotting, he was called anti-Semitic. Do you know why he was called anti-Semitic? Because all these fancy stores were owned by Jews who made their money from slavery. They've always been merchants. And they were, they, being merchants, they would import or export anything. Anything that money could buy, they would sell it. So their religion, their God was money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Still is. Okay. See, beliefs with um, Europeans, for the most part, not all Europeans, I can't paint everybody with the same brush, but for the most part, um, religious beliefs fall by the wayside when it comes in conflict with money. And guess what? That's the same thing for us too. Our beliefs fall to the wayside when it conflicts with money. Um, the, um, the, the slave trade in this country was um, constitutionally supposed to end in 1807. The importations of, of enslaved people was supposed to end in 1807, but it did not. Um, they did the end run and they started uh, unloading slaves in the ports in Mobile, Alabama, uh, Galveston, Texas, those places. Uh, and there were there were slave breeding farms in Richmond, Virginia, and in the eastern shore of Maryland to supply enslaved people uh, for the Deep South. And um, uh, uh, during this period, um, prior to this period, when we started talking about things like uh, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, Civil War, people were enslaved before there was a, a country called America, before there was the United States. People were enslaved in this country. If it had not been for enslaved people, um, the Revolutionary War would, be, would have been lost. What happened is uh, George Washington, and let me back up even further than that. Uh, all the states had militias, slave states had militias. South Carolina organized a militia for the express purpose of tracking down uh, enslaved people who had escaped and to combat against slave revolts. The other states followed suit with these militias. And every white man was um, ordered to own a gun. So uh, when the Revolutionary War started, um, George Washington solicited the uh, militias to come in to help fight the war. Some of the states agreed to that, but most of them didn't because they wanted to protect themselves from their enslaved people. The ones who agreed to that, what George Washington uh, encountered, were people in a militia who were like, I'm tired, I'm going home. And they would leave. Or, I'm not fighting today. And they wouldn't. So he encountered also militia members who uh, would go into battle and run. They would drop their weapons and run away. So there was a proposal made uh, that enslaved people uh, be brought into the war. The British did it first. And when the British did it, they did it on the grounds of freeing those who fought in the war. And when, the, uh, when George Washington saw how close America was to losing to the British and coming under the uh, king. What, he, what George Washington did, he made the same proposal to our American uh, slave owners and they rejected the proposal. 
So when they rejected it, the war got worse. And then there were some who released slaves in the North to fight. And, and during the period of um, um, the um, period where enslaved people were fighting with George Washington, that the British began to be pushed back. The South would not send their militias, especially South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama. They would not send their militias. So George Washington sent a representative to uh, the South especially just to South Carolina in particular, and said, we need to, we need to, um, we need to take the enslaved and allow them to fight in this war. We are losing. Other states said, okay, we're going to do this. You know what South Carolina said? No. South Carolina said, we would rather surrender and take our chances with the king than to allow a weapon to be put in the hands of an enslaved person. Of course, it wasn't said that nicely, but they were willing to, to um, cease being a part of this patchwork of states rather than no, rather than winning the war by using enslaved people to fight. And South Carolina never released anyone to fight in that war. And if it had not been for enslaved people, this would still be a British colony. Questions, comments? My question... South Carolina was still exporting cotton to Britain during the war, so they needed they needed those enslaved people to do that too. Yes, thank you. So we tied in we have tied in Christianity's walk through this, our travels to America. Mm -hmm. Jewish. Are they just as entwined in Christianity in terms of our walk towards America? They're I, I not, don't understand the Jewish religion in its its role in this. That's what I wanted to ask. Yeah. They're not entwined as you um it, with the religious aspects of it as they are with the money. Okay. All right. Um, that's a whole different thing about Israel now and, and uh, what we're talking about with enslaved people because it was still Palestine until okay. um, and it was a British colony by the way, Palestine that um, helps. go ahead that helps, that helps oh. me understand that better, okay, thank you thank you Anyone? I have a question uh -huh. uh, regarding the American Revolution War, was South Carolina the only colony in the South that didn't provide um, weapons to their enslaved, or was it um, all the Southern states? Take a guess. That's us. That's right. South Carolina yeah. was the only one. Oh, well, Gamecocks! All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I don't I don't think that it, it's coincidental at all when you look at the fact that the first enslaved people who came into this country was not 1619, it was 1521. The Spanish brought enslaved people into South Carolina in the PD region in 1521. And they overpowered them and escaped. So I don't think it's coincidental that, that South Carolina re reacted the way they did, I don't. I don't think it's coincidental that the overwhelming majority of enslaved people were, were uh, offloaded in South Carolina. It's a reason for that. If, if, if the most feminine energy for the support of enslaving people and, and using barbaric methods to keep them in line is South Carolina, 
And South Carolina is also the place where the most spiritual people on earth were unloaded. Can you, uh, uh, can you see where I'm going with this? Yes. yes. The greater need for balance was seen in South Carolina because South Carolina represented every single thing that was adverse to the livelihood of the African. And the African who's, who are um, the most spiritual and obligated uh, to bring spirituality to the world, they collided in Charleston. And here we are to this day with the loud voice of South Carolina being a great influence in how this country moves and how the other Southern states move. You may laugh at Lindsey Graham for some of the stupid comments he make. You may uh, criticize him uh, for being a chameleon, uh, changing with the, the, the wind. But Lindsey Graham is very influential in the policies of this nation. Countless people pick up on what Lindsay says, and we call them the far right extremists. No, Lindsay influences policy when it, especially when it comes to people of color. We lose, we have lost that because of the some of the, the, the stupid things he says, or we have lost that because he flip flops. But keep in mind, the message is the same. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. So, um, I'm trying to think of where, where we want to go from here. So, um, oh, also, um, uh, the, um, at this point, let me interject this. South Carolina was adverse to any enslaved person or, or a free African having a gun, having a weapon in their hand. South Carolina argued for a right to bear arms to be added to the Constitution. When it talks about the right to bear arms and it speaks about a well-regulated militia, it is not talking about the National Guard. It is talking about the militias who were slated to protect slave owners from the enslaved and to, and, and to, um, and to capture those who had ran away, especially those who were headed to Florida because they knew once they got into Florida, they would not be able to, to get them back because of the guerrilla warfare that was taking place in Florida from day one with enslaved people. So this well-regulated militia did not is not there because of a national guard. It's there because South Carolina was the preeminent force in making sure that it happened and the other Southern uh, states with militias join in. And, and they were willing, they meaning those states were willing to, to walk away. Because South Carolina said, we can scuttle the whole thing. We really, basically, we really don't care whether we become uh, a confederation of states or not. Whether we have a constitution, it doesn't matter. And that's how the Second Amendment got into the Constitution. So I, I use these examples um, in order for us to see the preeminent role uh, that South Carolina played uh, in, the, in the whole um, makeup of, of this country from the, from the inception of it to where we are now. 
Um, any questions about that? Oh my God, what time is it? Um, with you guys' permission, I, I would like to um, move maybe for another, what, 10, 15 minutes? Are we good with this? Yes. Okay. Okay. I see head shaking also. Um, the the preeminent role that South Carolina played in in the Constitution and getting the Second Amendment doesn't stop there. The same thing happened in eighteen the War of eighteen twelve when the U.S. Uh, made an effort uh, to um, annex Canada. And and they had to um, to fight the British again, and they lost that war because of the number of enslaved people that the British brought in for the war. Footnote: There was no true standing army in America until there was the establishment of a Department of Defense. And the Department of Defense came into existence during World War II for the express purpose of having a disciplined, a disciplined force to protect the country, whether it's on foreign soil or this soil. That's something to think about. So, um, of course, we've heard pretty much everything about uh, the Civil War. Um, the role that that Black preachers played, or that African preachers played in um, the allocation of 40 acres and a mule. Um, after the Civil War, uh, Lincoln sent General Sherman to uh, Savannah, Georgia. And while he was in Savannah, Georgia, he asked, he brought together our Black ministers. Um, and he asked these African ministers, what is it that we need to do to ensure that the freed slaves can prosper in this environment. My words, but that's the gist of what you said. And those ministers said, we need land. And the land is no good without a mule. And they gave them, they took plantations and divided it up into 40 acres and they bought mules where there were no mules on these uh, plantations and they gave them to African people. So the idea of the 40 eggs and the mule, it happened. But there's one caveat to that. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Abraham Lincoln's vice was Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee, and he was a slaveholder. He was a plantation owner in Tennessee. And when, when uh, Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson, through petitions from the Southern uh, plantation owners, or previous plantation owners, for them to return their land. And Andrew Johnson returned all the land to the people who uh, it had been confiscated from. So the South did not lose the war. They lost the battle. They won the war because the winners of the war controls the nation that they occupy. And when, though, when that happened, on the heels of that came this myth of Reconstruction and 
that was ended with um uh, what's his name? Rutherford B.A.'s in 1877, I believe it was. So this whole idea of enslavement in this country is so convoluted until it's virtually impossible to talk about it in a sequential matter, a manner, because all of it is so convoluted. And every, at every turn, we find South Carolina. The largest number of enslaved people to ever be auctioned off in one day took place in Charleston. I think it was 675, maybe. Um, Audrey mentioned uh, South, Africa, South Africans being brought here to learn how South Carolina kept its enslaved people in order. Before we get to that, um, I, I want to talk about the, uh, the Willow Lynch syndrome. However, I'm going to take a break for a, a minute. I'm, I'm going to the bathroom. So, so uh, if you guys can talk amongst yourselves, I'll be right back. Okay. I don't hear anyone talking. The other thing, the other the thing about the War of eighteen twelve is um, the British. The the British basically, <clears throat> um, the Brit the British basically did a campaign for enslaved people to come and join them because they kind of told them well. Your war of independence didn't free you, but if you fight with us now, we will definitely free you. So a lot of a lot of enslaved people went, left their plantations or wherever, escaped, and went to join the British um, because they felt like the the war for independence didn't help them. Constitution didn't help them. So they basically felt like the only way we're going to get free is to go join the British. So, um, so because of that, and, and, and turning around to look at Francis Scott Key writing the, the, the U.S. national, American national anthem, part of his that second stanza or wherever, part of his, part of that is because of all those enslaved people who went to fight with the British. He was basically shading them for having done that. Um, so, so when you think about that anthem, um, hmm, it's a bit suspicious. So it had nothing to do with with real. It, it had to do with American patriotism, but for white people, not for enslaved people. Now, and, and if you read the history of it, uh, based on what we've been taught, the only patriots were, were white people. The only only ones who fought in these wars were white people. That's what you get from the history that we've been taught. You don't get any sense of the African being the, the, uh, turned into tide in the war. And, and we hear about the uh, enslaved people escaping to Canada. A lot of this was because of the War of 1812. That's why Canada became a Mecca uh, for runaway slaves. Uh, <clears throat> so this whole journey in America has been wrought a uh, paved with um, a sense of separation and a sense of control, um, a dehumanizing 
the, the largest dehumanizing factors. Um, in 1712, there was um, a plantation owner from the West Indies who was invited to uh, Virginia to speak to the uh, the the plantation of the enslavers in that area, and <clears throat> his name was Willie Lynch. Um, Willie Lynch. Well, let me back up a second. When we talk about lynchings, the word lynching comes from his last name. Um, Willie Lynch taught um, them how, them meaning plantations on them, how to um, make a Negro a slave, uh, how to make an African a slave. There are some who say that this is the letter is myth, but there's more evidence that it was real. His primary premises was this. If you enslave the mind and keep the body, you will have slaves for at least 300 years. Think about that. Why is it that most Africans in America had never heard of Willie Lynch, but especially during the 60s and 70s, what was the chant, free your mind? Free your mind, and the rest will follow. How did they know that? How did we know that? when most people to this day have never heard of Willie Lynch. So how did he go about this? Create division within the ranks of Africans, period. So what did he do? He talked about being separated geographically. He talked about um, uh, how their history, how their culture, uh, that's a list of things uh, that, that uh, happened during that period. Uh, separate them on the basis of pigmentation of the skin, uh, language, gender, on down the line. And it worked. And to this day, it works. We have to be freed from the Willie Lynch syndrome. And what I just said to you is the gist of the Willie Lynch syndrome. So how, how do you free your mind? Willie Lynch told you how to free your mind. If you look at everything that was done to keep us separate and to enslave our minds, then do just the opposite. If enslaving our minds included um, separating based on uh, um, pigmentation or separating based on who got good hair and who got nappy hair, or uh, separation based on uh, um, gender, or uh, anything that could divide us, then we flipped the script. And yesterday, that's what we did. We flipped the script. We talked about where we came from and we were walking towards where we are. Where we are as a people worldwide, we are still suffering 
from the Willie Lynch syndrome. There are people who are say that they are not an African. There were people who didn't even want to say they're African American. It did not become popular with black folk until white people bought into it. When the newscasters, when the media start re referencing us as uh, African Americans, that's when we bought into being African American. But before that, we just Americans. And we're the only people in this country who are not Americans by virtue of privilege. Think about that. But yet, we are more willing to say we are American than a Hawaiian is, or than, than uh, uh, Italian American is. The least of all the people in this country who enjoy the privileges of this country, we are the least likely to do it. Pennies, nickels, and dimes built um, the um, uh, community in Tulsa. What was it? They, they burned? Come on. What the community in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Greenwood? Greenwood district. Uh, they burned it. Why? Nickels and dimes built that community. They would accept pennies as a deposit in the banks. We were not in those communities only to survive. We were in those communities to prove the white people we could be just like them. It didn't work. Regardless of who you are, you are still an African. That's not the word they use, but you know the word they use. You are still in Africa. And you can deny it all you want to. You are not going to be treated any differently than those who embrace it. And the majority of the people who do not embrace the reality of being African are in church. I can hear a preaching gather right now saying laughingly, I ain't no African, I'm an American. And I can't say what I said. I don't want to say what I said to him. It was dumb. You are dumb, you know. The rest of us start with A. So never was able to get him to understand what he was saying. Whether this syndrome disconnect them from each other, but more importantly, disconnect them from their history and their culture. That's the Willis syndrome. So how did we combat that? The institution of Pan-Africanism says that regardless of where you are on this planet, if your ancestry is African, you are an African. We are one entity. You know how we talk about um, uh, um, one yet many? When we talk about Elohim, the, the uh, concept of Pan-Africanism says that regardless of where we are, we are one yet many. Where did that concept come from? They weren't talking about we, we Elohim, but that's the same concept. And as long as we fight the reality of being one yet many, regardless of what we are on the face of this earth, we will remain enslaved to the Willie Lynch syndrome. Our minds will remain shackled by us. All Willie Lynch was saying is this. If you do this generation after generation, they are going to embrace it 
and you don't have to have shackles on them, you can still control them. That's all he was saying. And, and right now, the very people who say they are not African, and again, most of them are church folks, right now they're doing everything they can to be like white people. They're doing everything they can to, to mimic the enslaver as opposed to embracing the roots of who they are. I'm not saying that you 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 can't not live comfortably. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is, how can you be comfortable living denying who you are? How can you be comfortable living with the a lie that has destroyed your culture, your history, your integrity. What is it, Levon? The truth. If the truth makes you uncomfortable, don't blame the truth. Blame the lie that made you comfortable. That's it. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. If um, Mr. Lynch knew how to destroy the culture, he, he had to have some type of sense of understanding of spirituality, correct? Or bottom line, how did he know how to do that? Um, he did not have to have any spirituality about him at all. Uh, he did it from a psychological uh, standpoint. It, it's not difficult if you are, if, if you are, um, one who contemplates or one who observes um, humanity. It's not that difficult to do, to come up with how can we, how can we divide and conquer these people? And well, then, go ahead, someone. You also have to realistically just flat out say the creator had a hand in this as well. Oh, I, yes. yes. So, I mean, the how, uh, all of this is orchestrated so that this could take place where we are now. Thank you, Ron, for interjecting that. Because if we had not become uncomfortable with the lie that we have been told, we would never be doing what we are doing now. The lie was no longer comfortable, whether it be the, the, the Christianity church, et cetera. It, it was no longer comfortable. Why would the creator do this? I will bring you back to me, even if I had to have to take you across the great sea in chains. This is not to diminish us. This is to enhance humanity. Granted, it's a hell of a way to do it through our eyes anyway. I tell you, I've, I've, I've wished a thousand times that he could have come up with something better than this. But, it, but this is what we are faced with. The greatest image of our cultural beliefs, our spirituality, our humanity, is being backed into a corner, uh, treated uh, awfully by, by barbarians, and at the same time, loving them and forgiving them. That's who we are. And that includes the people who don't know who they are. The, the, one, the way we love based upon knowing who we are is because we know that we are here to bring enhancement to the spiritual, uh, spirituality of those who enslaved us. Those who deny who they are are in love for a different reason. They love them because they want to be them. That's a huge difference. 
Can you see that? They are perpetuators of the system of enslavement and they don't even know it. If, if there was some way uh, for the enslavers, the Europeans to see this day, do you think they would have enslaved us? When, when, when what I'm talking about is this, if they knew that there was going to be a group of people who comes together, taking the journey of spirituality to find out who they are, and then seeing that they are Elohim, and then going further to see who they really are spiritually by virtue of visiting the history of Eastern Africa. They never would have enslaved us. They enslaved us because they were greedy. They kept us from our history and continues to do that because they know who we are. Nothing has been, no one has been able to destroy us. No one. And regardless of the hardships that we have faced, we have always survived. Without what we are doing now, we are on the brink of, of our death in this country. Survival now is predicated on knowing who you are. Being caught up in the system of enslavement is destructive. We would be dead walking around every day. Those who deny who they are are dead. You cannot be spiritually alive and not search for an understanding of why you were here and who you are. Why did we have to go through this ordeal, this, this, um, this monstrous uh, uh, 400 year, uh, two, 400 year enslavement, this monstrous system society, this barbaric society, being, 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 being enslaved by barbarians would do anything, being enslaved by people who would hang us by our feet and skin us alive just like they skin a rat and have no compunction about it. A people who would cut a man's head off and put it on a stick and sit it by the side of the road as an example of what, it, what happens when you disobey me. That's barbaric. And yet, you want to be that? That's what you're embracing when you desire to mimic those who are enslaved. I have a question. Yes, sir. It's no coincidence, I suppose, that slavery lasts 400 years. Also, in the scriptures, slavery was 400 years. Anybody know that number? Does 400 have a significance to you? Does What does it mean? Go ahead, George, and get that book of numbers that you got beside you. Just curious. I know you're not that far from it. Hey, Pastor. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, while he's oh, going oh, through the look at hey, the... Charles, Charles, hold on a second. It's good to hear your voice, man. Charles has been in the hospital. He had, <laughs> he had surgery. So it's good to hear your voice again. Go ahead. All right. Um, when they made the Constitution, we were not involved in that Constitution, but we were still slaves. Right. So how did that work? Um, we were enshrined in the Constitution to be slave forever without even mentioning the word slave. And you, in, in order to get an understanding of that, you had to do one or two things. That is, read the papers, the Federalist Papers that led up to the writing of the Constitution or read the Constitution mm -hmm. itself. And you will see that we were not an afterthought. Everything that that the Europeans have done, we have been taken into consideration 
but not in a positive way. Um, Roosevelt wanted uh, um, insurance for everybody in the nation. How can we keep black people from getting it? They couldn't figure it out, so black, so they didn't do it. Social security. How can we keep a black folk from getting social security? Ah, I got a solution. Only pay 80% because they don't have any money to pay the 20%. So they won't be going to doctors and hospitals. That's why you have a 80% co-payment with social security. That's how in depth the thought of us is within them. Does that help you, Charles? Yes, it yeah. did. Thank you, sir. Uh, I know I've gone beyond what I said at uh, the time, the 15 minutes. Uh, well, the other okay. thing with Social Security, too, is um, they the, the Southern congressman said that it shouldn't go to um, anybody working on a farm or anybody working in a household. Domestic, yeah. Which was yeah. the only jobs Black people could get in the South. Um, I I remember when my grandmama first got Social Security. It has been that long since Black folk start getting Social Security. And, and you, it, one of the requirements also Audrey, was our birth certificate. And we didn't have birth certificates. We didn't get Social Security until they started accepting uh, the uh, Bible because Black folk were right in the Bible as each child was born, when the, the date and the year that they were born. And that's how uh, the generation, in my, my grandmama's generation and others got Social Security because they could prove their birth with the Bible. Okay, the, uh, um, are we, do we want to go further now? Because I'm telling you, I, I'm good. But I don't want to carry you beyond uh, where you anticipated being in terms of time. I want to respect that. Okay. So those who those who I can see, if you want to continue, say raise your hands. Those who I can't see, just say in the affirmative. If you don't, then that's 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 great. We just pick up tomorrow. Okay. We're, I have uh, one. Do, ahead, did we get an answer to what the four hundred is? Not yet. Uh, George, you got it. Are you having? It? Yeah, I'm. I'm looking at it, uh, Pastor. And again, as I say before, when I look at that number in totality, you know, again, it just gives me, you know, a different perspective versus me looking at it in terms of its single digits. But, uh, but for the most part you know, the particular uh, number 400, just give me one second. Unless there's someone else who can be of help. But it basically, you know, talks about, you know, the the angel number means that it's time to manifest your dreams. Um, I know it's more to that when I look at the number four and the number zero, but again, um, I just need to, um, you know, research that pastor. Okay. Um, well, what, zero, what did the four say, zero, George? Well, the number four, you know, talks about the importance of, um, again, creation. And as we, you know, talked about that in the past, uh, just to give a little bit more insight on the number four, um, it speaks in reference to, you know, uh, the number that connects the mind, body, soul, and spirit with the physical world of structure and organization. But four symbolizes safety and security of the home and the need for the stability and strength on a solid foundation. And I think that what we are speaking about is looking at our beginnings, looking at the foundation, but it calls uh, the spiritual nature of number four calls and the need for having or creating a sacred place or sanctuary 
you know, in our home. And I don't think that it refers to just the physical home, but the 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 Elohim that we are, a place to meditate and build on your innermost foundations of strength and being. Okay. So again, it's uh, the bottom line that I guess makes perfect it, sense. It's creation. Yeah. Go ahead, Barbara. I was going to say, that resonates. That makes perfect sense. 400 years. Okay, now recover who you are. Go back. Remember, go back to beginnings and, 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 and embrace who you are and create that uh, in spite of all of the chaos, all of the walking on water that you've had to done, do over 400 years. Go back and understand and remember who you are, embrace that, and build anew, create anew. That, that, that's what that just loudly says to me. I like that. So yeah, I do too. And the yeah. difference is, here's the difference. Pastor, you said something about, um, wow, after all of we, that we've gone through, um, how, can we, how can we be comfortable living a lie with a lie that has made us comfortable? And then LeVon added, the, if the truth makes you uncomfortable, don't blame the truth, blame the lie. The, the difference for us now is that that is not just for us. That's for humanity. And so we cannot be freed to create a, a balanced life unless everybody can partake in that balanced life. That's the major difference. We went through all of this for the sake of humanity. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank all of all right. you. Um, go ahead. Was that you, Ron? Who is the vice no, Thank you. I, I, I love that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me say this. I, I talked about in. I think one of the things that, that we're dealing with is that teachers, we as teachers are accustomed to, to um, discussing for understanding for much longer periods of time than we are accustomed to being on, on uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And this discussion has, has our actually raised the interest and raised uh, an awareness within the um, the body of, um, of of teachers specifically, but in the body of the of the people who are on this line uh, uh, generally. And are we, because right now this feels like a teacher's meeting, like enclave, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what this feels like. And that's maybe the reason uh, it's so difficult to stop at this point. Uh, also, those who are still on and were on have a flavor of what it's like when we are together uh, for days and, and, and are teaching each other for hours. So um, having said that, um, do, do you guys see this as a, a stopping point for now? And, and picking up tomorrow, because the continuation, I have no problem with it. We can get um, uh, get uh, Janice to break it up when it's posted. So it won't be, you know, continuous. I, I love responses. <laughs> I'm fine either way. If everybody's comfortable and keep going. I do have a question. And we can either answer it today or start with it tomorrow. Go ahead, my, que my question is this. When I did my research looking at Africa or uh, a cave alarm, I see the, the, a, a very special role that Egypt played. Egypt had a role in in Zimbabwe in 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 South Africa had a in Ghana Israel, Egypt played a role in the leadership of developing those lands uh 
Egypt also plays a prominent role in the scriptures. I don't think that's a coincidence. So there must be some spiritualness there that connects all of a cave alarm or the hearts of the something's there. Something's there that I don't quite see yet. And and uh you know, it might be something you want to ponder and, and ask answer later, but that's that's just one of my questions. Okay. I I I think I would rather wait because if if I address it now, mm -hmm. we will be here. We will be here for at least another hour. If I address, because if I address it now, it's gonna generate questions. Okay. So uh, unless you are down with another hour, dude, uh, we will wait and pick it up tomorrow. Just don't forget your question because, you know, sometimes the, the, the mind allows something, things to escape it. So that's why they made pencils and pens and typewriters and keyboards. So we can... Somebody, write will. Huh? Somebody will. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I think this is what we're going to do at this junction. Uh, we are going to um, end for now. And um, I solicit all of you uh, to um, make yourselves available tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Because we honestly don't want to miss any parts of this. Because we're not just talking. Everything we're saying is in the macro. And those people who we mentioned, whether it be the enslavers or whether it be Africans who do not who they are, this is available to them and it will influence them. Okay, thank you guys. Love you much. And um, we will meet again on tomorrow at six o'clock. Bye for now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.